So uh, I want to start this presentation with this quote from uh, philosopher Yu Kui. And he says, uh, we're more than ever in an epoch of cybernetics. So I want to ask, what does this epoch look like? And here are some images. Uh, what you see here is an underwater robot called a ranger bot uh, designed to protect the Great Barrier Reef and the reef ecosystem worldwide. It is equipped with uh, computer vision and technology trained with advanced machine learning algorithms. It can navigate through the ocean bed and identif identify a kind of a coral eating starfish that is considered a pest uh, in this uh, reef ecosystem and kill them with a lethal injection. So this is another image. Um, Precision farming almost becomes a paragon of sustainable agriculture, agriculture. And with sensors and robotic armatures, we can now manipulate plants on an individual level and optimize plant life with minimal energy input. Uh, and by the way, I, I got this image actually from SciArc's website, uh, which is a uh, architecture, in, uh, architecture school in California. And they use it, this image uh, to brand their synthetic landscape program. So the idea behind this is that, you know, designers thesis are seriously thinking about all of these kind of uh, applications in environmental design for better or for worse. And in the past decade, the smart city becomes the most ambitious cybernetic project that has mobilized different social sectors to develop smart, smart technologies that could make cities smarter. Uh, sensors, platforms, crowdsource data, machine learning algorithms, artificial intelligence, and whatnot. Myriads of new, tech, new tools are being developed every day to experiment with all kinds of feedback loops between urban systems. The goal is to make cities smarter, but what counts as smart? It is often narrowly defined as more efficient and more connected, um, making urban, system, uh, urban processes faster and growing urban data sets bigger. Though the idea of smart city bec has become extensively criticized from the very beginning, the critical voices do not stop the urge to optimize cities as cybernetic machines. A city is not a computer and in, uh, urban intelligence is more than information processing. Many criti uh, critics like Shannon Mattern cry out loud and clear. However, this apparent claim does not uh, end the cybernetics thinking's contagious nature. As long as one can conceptualize a thing as a system with measurable input and output, then a whole branch of mathematics and myriads of techniques in modern control theory are available to make this thing appear to be computable, controllable, and optimizable. This is why uh, you quite uh, ac accurately point out, we're more than ever in an epoch of cybernetics since cybernetics was not a discipline parallel to other disciplines such as philosophy and psychology, but rather it aims to be a universal discipline able to unite all other disciplines. Therefore, we could say a universal mode of thinking par excellence. So my research at many level is an interrogation on cybernetic thinking itself. And I coined this term cybernetic uh, environment in order to construct a field of inquiry between science, engineering, arts, and design. And I interrogate and investigate the underpinning and the underlying mode of thinking in, in all, all these emerging environmental practices revolving around cybernetic technologies. Uh, including environmental sensing, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and robotics. So my study um, has three chapters and each one focuses on one aspect in cybernetic environment. Um, the first one I wanna talk about is the ever deepening entanglement between nature and technology, between biotic and abiotic in all kinds, uh, all kinds of environmental processes. Both of the, these images are from around the same area. Uh, the Everglades in South Florida. Uh, Everglades restoration project uh, becomes a classic example of uh, adaptive management. And what you, what, you, what you see on the right, the ultimate wild place uh, is in fact carefully maintained by distributed actuators across the South Florida landscape. And this map shows the distributed machines that carefully calculate, simulate and regulate what is going in and out of Everglades, a wild place in many people's eyes. Our categorical language falls short when facing this entangled reality. And in fact, this is not a new idea. In a book, uh, The Machine in the Garden, historian and literary critic Leo Marx have rendered a image. A long shriek of a train whistle disturbs the serenity of an 18th century American village. He used this uh, term garden machine motif to tease out this, uh, this kind of a schizophrenic mindset and the, the inability to reconcile these two kingdoms of forces, nature and technology. And to use his words, the garden machine motif is the germ of 
the most final of all generalizations about America. And in the same vein, technology historian David Nye makes a similar observation and critique and investigating the notion of nature and technology in American environmental narratives. So for example, he argues that people find sublimity in both wild nature and engineered wonders, and together they serve as a source for a national identity. The wilderness image provides a myth of origin and in engineered achievements embody a story of technological transformation. And two kingdoms forces, nature and technology, justify a mainstream story of how early colonists wield technology to transform the wilderness in America into a nation we know today. And this, what, what is at work here is what I call a transformation formula. It's basically humans use technology to transform pristine nature into a habitable landscape. And in fact, if you, if, if you think about it, many of today's environmental narratives fall into this trope and this crude generalization. Think about Anthropocene. It sets up an imagined origin before humans enter the stage. It articulates a process of humans using technologies to produce agricultural systems, global industries, and megacities, and finally a human constructed planet. And based on the idea of Anthropocene, contemporary environmental narratives are filled with two kinds of narratives. On the one hand, we have this kind of a downscaling narrative, and for example, you know, half Earth idea. Uh, basically reserving half of the planet to nature and whatever nature means. And on the other hand, we have this upscaling idea, uh, which means to embrace humans' extraordinary technological power, such as you know, green technology, to produce a good Anthropocene and whatever good means or for good for whom. Uh, the fundament of all of these semi-problematic reasonings is the, this stubborn formula of technological transformation. Most importantly, what is emerging within these narratives between nature and technology is, is an image of the human who has the privilege to wield power from two kingdoms forces to justify their own existence. So my critique can be situated within this idea uh, found in environmental history, history of technology and science technology studies towards the late, late 20th century. And for example, these are two very important anthologies under the banner of uh, social, social constructivism in the 90s uh, and 80s. Both nature and technology are partly socially constructed, uh, thus laden with culturally specific, specific values. So what is emerging from this body of work is an inherent critique uh, of anthropocentrism and human exceptionalism. And at the same time, there's an urge to reconceptualize the human in relation to non-human machines and species. So that's why towards the 21st century, we have seen a rise of post-humanism across fields, including you know, the fields uh, investigating uh, nature and technology. So many scholars turned their attention away from critiquing nature and wilderness and shifted their attention to uh, non-human and non-human agency as a conceptual frame. And many of these post-human ideas are gaining their currency in intellectual life. And for example, actor network theory was originated um, from the field of social construction of technology and now has been imported into other disciplines, including uh, landscape design. And together, all of these post-human ideas presenting a kind of different conceptualizations of the relationship between human and non-human objects or assemblages. And here I quote Jane Bennett, a widely read author in landscape. And she says, bodies enhance their power in or as a heterogeneous assemblage and efficacy and effectivity to which that term agency has traditionally referred becomes distributed across ontologically heterogeneous field rather than being a capacity localized in, in a human body or in a collective co uh, produced only by human efforts. So over the past few years, we have seen uh, you know, landscape architects start to de deploy these frameworks uh, to, to reconceptual landscape design. And here I quote Brian Davis, and he, he says, and I quote, if a space is a landscape, then all of its objects uh, and their dynamic relations are instruments, but not dumb drills, uh, retaining walls, and land use policies. Rather, they're dynamic objects in relation to one another within a bounded territory containing some measures of human intent. However, uh, in these uh, you know, landscape efforts or this kind of post-human movement uh, at large lies a deeper irony here. So the problem here is that these so-called non-human frameworks turn non-human objects into actants in human narrator stories. And in the end, 
Non-human agency points to observed efficacy or effectiveness based on some human standards and in service of humans, while the intrinsic value as a non-human being in itself is still largely outside these all too human frameworks. And in the end, it becomes a kind of uh, ventriloquism. Uh, basically, we turn on humans into actants to perform the role we assign to them in the story we tell ourselves. So this is the biggest irony in post-humanism, I, I, I see. So searching for non-human agency leads to yet another level of uh, human hubris. Here, I quote Grim Harman, and he is a proponent for object-oriented ontology, or triple O for short. And he says, these type of reflection remain human-centered on no matter how many material entities they summon in a night to mold and shape human beings. And, and I, I really believe, you know, deep down, many landscape architects share the same kind of unease when we say, you know, we are choreographing non-human agents, but in the end, whatever story we tell, it always a story of, of humans, never a story of non-human species. And this irony actually leads to the second tension this study I'm trying to investigate. It is the predicament here, it, a predicament between the willingness to recognize more than human forms of agency and intelligence and the inability to surpass all to human frames and vocabularies. And one example you know, I can think of is that we want to recognize machine intelligence and develop power for machines. But deep down, we always have this fear of an AI gone rogue. We fear that they will behave unexpectedly even though the expectations are based on human standards and goals. So chapter two really starts with a literature review, comparing a range of popular post-human thinking, including new materialism, actor network theory, A and T, and more recent uh, object-oriented ontology, triple O. Uh, it turns out that many of these authors are, are aware and struggle with this irony I, I just presented in one way or another. Here I quote Jim Bennett again, and towards the end of her book, she seems to be confused by her own choice of term. And in, in a note, she says, you know, as I struggle to choose the right term, I confront a profound ambiguity in both terms regarding wherein lies the cause and wherein lies the effect. And searching for non-human agency for her is really about looking for a cause that, that animates these non-human to act, right? But the stories she tell becomes effect you know, we observe in favor of our own narrative as humans. And eventually, all of these scholars, post-human scholars, agree uh, in one way or another that there is something surplus in an assemblage or object that cannot be reduced at by, uh, and are accessed by any means whatsoever. And they cannot be told through human stories. And this search for non-human agency in the early 21st century uh, eventually evolves into a kind of a speculative realism movement um, that we are in now. Uh, and to understand what this speculative realism entails, I have to mention Triple O's difference comparing to other contemporary you know, popular thoughts here, uh, is that the Triple O is operating within a completely different paradigm. And this is why it appears so controversial to many but the thing is that, you know, a lot of the critiques of Triple O makes no sense at all, since they're concerned with a completely different, different set of questions. So Triple O authors, I found, is that they never use the term agency in their narratives, because they know agency always points to an attribution of human perceived uh, efficacy. And instead, they start by accepting that things are withdrawn from any form of access. Uh, I quote again, uh, Timothy Morton says, and I quote, things exist in a profoundly withdrawn way. They cannot be splayed open and totally, uh, totally grasped by anything whatsoever, including themselves. You cannot know a thing fully by thinking it, by eating it, or by measuring it, or by painting it. And this is why from a triple O's perspective, many of these so-called non-human frameworks are trapped in a philosophy of access or a philosophy of human access. They assume things can be accessed by human thoughts. So whatever is inaccessible is not a philosophical project and does not deserve discussion. And therefore, Triple O, what Triple O is really critical about is the present day's uh, philosophical thinking's inability, or better, unwillingness to create a speculative ontology which moves beyond the narrow confines of what is given to, to our all-too-human modes of understanding. So 
Triple is gaining popularity among designers in the past few years uh, for various reasons. And uh, for example, Sai Arc, the, the architect who I mentioned just now, uh, has hired both Harman and Timothy Morton, which are two, two of them, them are both uh, proponents in Triple O. As professors of philosophy in their architecture and landscape program. And funny enough is that, you know, Morton also served as a landscape competition jury last year. Um, and I believe the most fundamental reason for Triple O to be so popular is that designers have an identity crisis uh, these days and among other modern disciplines. We have been struggling to describe the kind of designerly ways of knowing and thinking. And from a Triple O standpoint, designers work speculates, but this type of speculation cannot fit within contemporary philosophical and epistemological frameworks that intrinsically devalue any form of speculation. There is an urge to look for a new framework to conceptualize design. So I'll get back to this idea of design and speculation in a moment, because before that, I have to you know, think about Triple O's implication on how we understand machine intelligence and its role in environmental practice. And I, as, pre, as pre, previously mentioned, following the transformation formula, cybernetic machines can only be conceptualized uh, as a uh, effective means for humans to extend perceived agency and control and transforming a nature uh, into habitable landscapes. And for example, when you search smart cities, images like this are very common and they depict intelligent machines as a layer of so-called digital infrastructure on top of a city, optimizing different urban processes to make the city appear to be more efficient and sustainable. And of course, another underlying reasoning is that, you know, when cities are more efficient, a pristine nature out there can be preserved. And cybernetic technologies are merely another way to perfect the transformation formula that I just critiqued. So, um, however, the, the things that, you know, both post-humanism and uh, research on machine intelligence over the past few years have challenged us to come up with a different way to conceptualize machines. So I'm, I'm gonna talk about this example. So many think AlphaGo um, and an AI trained to playing the game, game of Go was a brute force simulation model that simulates every possible move when playing the game. But this is not the, how this uh, deep reinforcement learning works in training AlphaGo. So in fact, AlphaGo plays very much like a human player. Uh, so when you think about it, when human plays a, a game of Go, they do not, so we do not simulate every possible step, but only play the move that we feel right and at the moment and, and, and has the best chance to put us in a better position against our opponents. And this is exactly what AlphaGo does, playing a move by analyzing the current board and trying to put itself in a better position. So most importantly, in a la later versions, uh, you know, in a later version of AlphaGo Zero, the machine has no human knowledge input at all and surpassed all its previous versions. And it is trained with a technique called uh, self-play which means an agent playing against itself with no human intervention. And in a way we can say that, you know, the machine has developed its own understanding of the game and start to devise strategies with a machine flavor. And because of this, I will say without hesitation that AlphaGo is not a machine that simulates human intelligence, but a truly creative player. And and one thing I want to mention is that, you know, we need to realize that Go is invented, the game of Go is invented 2000 years ago and have always been explored solely by humans. And we think we have exhausted it, but AlphaGo came and proved that there is still much new to explore in this old game. And over the years, uh, machine learning agents repeatedly su surprise us and let us question our all too human ways of knowing. And here's another quote after a professional gamer played with a, against a gaming AI called AlphaStar, uh, which is a cousin of AlphaGo, of course. And I, I highlight some words he used here. And basically he says, the AI is unorthodox with strategies entirely its own. It is unusual and makes you question the diverse possibilities of this old game. So one thing important here is to, you know, to really bypass the human machine rivalry trope popularized by you know, media. It is not about that. It is about human machine co-production. The kind of intelligence co-produced between the, the human and the machine manifested in uh, new ways to play in an old game. 
It is about co-evolution in which diverse possibilities emerge when humans and machines explore something together. And this is why posthumanism and Triple O are so crucial for developing a framework in understanding intelligent machines as objects that are you know, sometimes out of human control and access. So here's another example of a less intelligent machine according to human standards. It's artist Su Guan Cheng's uh, drawing operation. So it is a series of drawing duets in which the artist and the robot arm draws together. And the, robot, the, the robotic arm would uh, mimic the artist's movement by analyzing her drawing gesture and through an overhead camera and reproduce the same movement. However, the robot movements was not perfect. Though the algorithm could track her line work perfectly in, in the digital simulation, the, the movement would be dramatically altered when translated to the, to the arm. The robot's line work constantly jitter as if the robot did not have a steady hand. And all of these imperfections are inherent to the material and technical uh, limitations of the robot. So during the performance, Su Guan was forced to adapt her movement to the robot's movement in real time. And her new gesture feed back to the robot. And the robot then produced a new set of gestures that Su Guan had to adapt again. And so they start to form this uh, positive feedback loop and they together become a coupled system with new styles and techniques manifested in, uh, in the co-produced artifact. So the artist and the robot gradually synchronized and attuned to each other in a wild territory alien to both. So that actually leads to the third tension uh, in, my, in my research uh, that I investigate. <clears throat> it, it is, so this tension speaks to the liminal space between our intentionality and a reality co-produced by more than human agents through cybernetic feedback mechanism or a cultivated wallness. Um, Norbert Wiener in his 1948 book first publicly used this term cybernetics to refer to this kind of recursive processes and self-regulation behavior found in the animals and uh, in, in machines and animals. And as plainly stated by the title, Wiener envisioned cybernetics to be a study of control and communication across different entities. So I'll, I'll, what, what that means is that, you know, cybernetics positions communication or the exchange of information at the center of control. So what this means is that, so basically before cybernetics become the fundament of modern control theory, people need to figure out, you know, the internal structure of a machine and understanding the how machine work internally uh, to figure out a way to control the machine. But cybernetics, uh, you know, turns the machine into a black box and by measuring its input and output or the exchange of information, AKA communication, we can start to develop control strategies to control the machine. So, and then this idea actually underpins all modern machines, including some most advanced uh, machine learning algorithms today, such as, you know, AlphaGo. And all modern machines are cybernetic machines. And by measuring the output with sensors, we can feed the signal into a controller, which we, you know, we can model some control laws or control policies and deploy them with actuators to change system dynamics. And this ex also explains why sensing, modeling, and actuating are regarded as uh, the three fundamental processes to conceptualize feedback mechanism. And on these uh, three different fronts, people start, can start to make progress, right? And this is exactly what mainstream technology, you know, technological development is doing. And maybe let's consider smart city for a moment uh, again. And a mainstream logic goes like this. So with better sensor, sensors and better sensor placement in the city, we can better understand the urban system. And with better modeling techniques, such as machine learning, we can make better predictions and compute control policies. And with more powerful and effective actuators in the system, we can have better control authority. So, but we, we have seen something different here. Um, as we saw in Su Guan's drawing duet, the artist and the robot are not in a good communication. There is no control whatsoever. But the underlying thinking is very much cybernetic, this kind of recursive causality and self-regulation self processes found in, in, in both the artist and the robot. So in other words, the feedback loop and recursive processes have always been explored with, with a premise that you know, things are accessible and uh, they, they are communicative. 
uh, and thus controllable. But in Su Guan's case, you can almost convince yourself that there is another interpretation of this recursive mechanism in cybernetic thinking. And if we take on a triple O's lens uh, more seriously and start to start with a premise that you know, things are withdrawn and non-communicative and thus uncontrollable, then what does cybernetic even mean in this context, right? And this is exactly the question that, I, that drives my chapter three. And by collecting a range of emerging cybernetic practices across art, science, and engineering and design, I'm trying to map out an alternative way to understand cybernetic thinking about uncontrollability and non-communication and provide alternative terms other than sensing, modeling, and actuating, uh, but coding, choreographing, and attuning. So first, uh, I wanna re reinterpret the sensing practices. So uh, what you see here is an art installation called uh, Telepresent Wind by David Bowen. The installation consists of two parts, a series of tilting devices, which you see here, are distributed on, on a gallery floor. Each device is made of a dry stock plant, a uh, dry plant stock connected to a servo motor. And the second part, what you see here is a uh, plant uh, connected to a accelerometer and placed outdoor. And when wind blows, accelerometer will capture the exact movement of that dry stock and transmit the data to the device in the gallery. And the tilting device re replicate the exact movement in real time as if there's wind in the gallery and thus it's called telepresent wind. So Bowen's project produced something interesting here. So it actually produce, produced some data about wind, but definitely different from the data collected with an anemometer, which is a standardized uh, scientific instrument for measuring wind. So Bowen's art project teased out something about environmental sensing that is so apparent, but people always overlook, is that we do not really collect data. We merely invent instruments to code the environment into a datascape made of ones and zeros. So the anemometer on the left and the plant stock on the right are the same in terms of coding the environment into data. The only difference is that, you know, anemometer as a scientific instrument is deeply embedded within a socio-technical ensemble made of scientists, standards, and protocols that justify, legitimize, and naturalize a, se naturalize a series of coding practices. So the moral behind the story is that, you know, there remain so many different ways to code the environment other than what is framed by contemporary environmental sensing practices that focuses solely on control and communication. And this, this is also you know, why I believe that you know, citizen sensing holds much promise in this cybernetic environment to provide other ways to understand, uh, understand and connect to the environment. In the second uh, project, I wanna talk about uh, modeling with an example uh, from, uh, it is an engineering project from the Link Lab at UVA. So basically over the past few years, I was on a team of scientists exploring different machine learning techniques in environmental management in, a city, in the city of Norfolk, Norfolk in Virginia. It is a coastal city faced with many climate related challenges um, uh, you know, from flooding to sea level rise. And I will talk about one specific research uh, conducted by my engineer friend, Benjamin Bose, and I'll call him Ben for now. So Ben was trying to train a, a machine learning agent to manage a simulated stormwater system inspired by a real system in Norfolk. So the system has two subcatchments and each one connects to a retention pond. The outlet of the pond is a valve that can be opened and closed to any degree. And the agent's job is to control these uh, two valves to change the water volume in the two retention ponds. And the goal are uh, there, there are two goals in this. The first one is to prevent overall flooding in the system. And the second one is to keep a desired water level uh, in those two ponds. So here Ben applies the same deep reinforcement learning framework or DRL uh, used in training AlphaGo. So basically in a nutshell, what we can compare DRL to uh, human learning through trial and error. So the agent starts by observing the environment. Based on this observation, it will try to uh, you know, come up with, with a random action. If the action is effective, then the agent gets rewarded or it will, penalized, uh, it will be penalized if the action is not effective. 
So by doing this observation, action, and reward loop repeatedly, the agent can gradually learn to control, control the simulated system. And now you see how you know, cybernetic thinking is actually underpinning all modern machines, right? So the way uh, you know, my engineer friend Ben communicated with this agent was through this objective function on the right. And actually it turns out that most machine learning research is eventually down to designing a good objective function that articulates what the engineers want. And DRL is all about optimizing that you know, re reward function. So the agent can get rewards in two ways. Uh, reduce flooding in the system, which is the first line of the function, or to maintain a desired water level in a retention pond, the second, second line. So they are, they, they are actually a pair of conflicting goals, right? So when you think about it, so right after rainfall, the ponds are full. And uh, if you're trying to maintain the desired water level, you have to lower that water level by discharging water quickly. But discharging water might actually cause flooding downstreams if you discharge water you know, too soon. So there's a concept uh, in machine learning called, uh, called reward hacking. It's actually in AI safety, it's called reward hacking, meaning the agent can cheat the system to get more reward. Um, because when we articulate reward functions, there are, we, we are essentially assigning values to goals. But for the AI system, whatever we didn't say in the reward function, we automatically assign, assigned a zero value to it. So in this function, even though it appears to be two lines, but in fact, it's infinite lines of zeros that the agent does not care. But the funny thing is that this null space becomes where an agent can exploit the reward function and doing something unexpected. And here you can see how this intentionality and the unintentionality start to play out in machine learning as well. So, and in fact, this is exactly what this agent did in the end. It would, so this agent would close and uh, open and close the valves repeatedly right after the rain, rainfall to discharge water in small, uh, sm really small doses because it wants to return the ponds to a target water level as quickly as possible. And of course, this behavior would uh, cause some minor floods downstreams, but the agent simply doesn't care um, because it can still get rewards for doing so because uh, in the reward function, uh, flood is evaluated by volume rather than frequency. So the agent does not care how, much, how many, you know, these small, small flood events it caused as long as the overall volume is under a threshold. And the agent can still get enough reward from the second part of the reward function. And in a way, the, the agent has some bias towards this uh, you know, storm, stormwater system, which gives scientists enough motivation to implement another function to eliminate that bias. But if we you know, look at this phenomena from a post-humanist perspective, we we'll realize that you know, AI bias does not necessarily mean that we have to implement another function to penalize this AI based on some human standards. And instead, this behavior actually asks us to reflect on how stormwater system have always been optimized based on only a few parameters and uh, based on our all too human ways of understanding. And the agent's unexpected behavior by exploiting the frequency dimension of the flood event you know, um, it actually reminds designers that we have a whole range of you know, landscape strategies based on frequency rather than volume waiting to be explored. And especially thinking about you know, separate physical systems that allow for live update and, and real-time responses. And of course, there's so much you know, interesting things to discuss in this example. For example, we can think about you know, developing AI agents to intentionally cause flood in some area of the city and to promote emergent ecologies. But the major takeaway is that our relationship with a, with a model is changing. We render our intention through some objective functions which will never be comprehensive. And we can, turn to, we can actually turn to you know, landscape design and rely on this notion of choreographing to further illustrate the kind of relationship between uh, designers and machines. So the term choreograph is gaining popularity among the landscape architects over the years. And many would agree that the term choreograph cannot be separated from landscape architects uh, Lawrence Halprin's theory and practice. So in the 70s, Halprin introduced the RSVP cycle to describe his landscape design principles. And here S stands for score. 
And it is not, you know, the, the grade or score you get from a test. It's, it's akin to the musical scores. Uh, it's basically a series of instruction for setting things in motion or setting agents in motion. So Hopperin in his book writes, you know, uh, scores communicate, but do not control. So this apparent wordplay on Winner's original book title suggests that Halperin found recursive thinking in cybernetics useful, but he wanted to see it in a different light rather than controlling communication. Halperin developed his, uh, this scoring idea with his wife, Anna Halperin, uh, who was a choreographer in the 60s. And by the time, many composers and choreographers uh, embraced a kind of uh, participatory and open-ended compositions and choreograph uh, choreographies known as open scores, which uh, replaced the traditional notational system that decisively direct the performers. And for example, John Cage was a pioneer in, in open score um, movement. And, uh, and Hop Hopperin and still actively you know, doing this kind of uh, uh, public dance events. And this is her explaining the movement through scores. And this is how the scores play out with uh, participants interpretation. And as we can see, the, it is very much like the relationship between uh, engineers and their models they're trying to train, um, in, especially in the example I showed. There's always a space of uh, unintentionality outside designer's intent. And with the idea of choreographing, I'm promoting to embrace the unintended null space and the wild and the, the kind of unexpected outcomes in machine intelligence a sense of uh, wildness in machines. So finally, I'm gonna think about actuation. So the question here is, um, you know, if repeated action or repeated processes do not lead to control, then how do we understand actuation and what has been actuated? Here, I need to introduce another concept called attuning. So attuning is a, is a, is a triple concept uh, proposed by Timothy Morton. And he argues, since a thing cannot be known directly or totally, uh, one can only attune to it with greater or lesser degrees of intimacy. Attunement is a living dynamic relation with another being. So here I wanna use Leif Estrada's project uh, towards sentience uh, to talk about attuning. So the designer proposed a cyber physical infrastructure to, uh, in a river system uh, for a landform building. And one of his prototype is called attuners, which are these uh, you know, servo motors connected to the acrylic rods. So when the servo, the servo motor you know, moves, it will drive the you know, rods up and down to manipulate water flow um, in, in, in the river and to build some different landforms downstreams. And the topography is monitored by sensor arrays and feedback, feed, uh, feedback to the actuators. So this is a cybernetic machine. And there is no machine learning involved in, 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 this, in this project, but the idea is that the machine will gradually attune to the river environment and produce another new set of landscape patterns beyond designer's intentionality. And the designer will have to attune to these new patterns closely by developing new interfaces and adjust, adjust their strategies. And the result is a cultivated well, well, uh, wildness full of uh, accidents co-produced by more than human actors. So finally, I can you know, clarify what I mean by cybernetic environment. So the environment no longer stands for a passive background and a tabula rasa on which designers entertain system dynamics. Rather, designers have to confront a cybernetic environment laden with different forms of distributed intelligence, including machine intelligence. And thus to design is no longer about using localized human intelligence to solve environmental problem, problems, which uh, is an is a illusion from a post-humanist perspective. And instead to design is to recognize and acknowledge other forms of mental processes that are different from ours and develop ways attuned to those mental processes. And in a way, actors' actions modify each other and the outcome is always already a mashup of different perspectives goals and objective functions. And the result of the co-production lies outside everyone's original intention. And consequently, will wildness start to describe a sense of perceived wild condition with unexpected outcomes that cannot fit within every participant's mental model? So here I want to um, you know, quote Brian Davis again. 
Um, a landscape is made of instruments uh, or agents whose action never align perfectly with a user's inter intention, but are always doing more or less, creating a liminal space between intent and reality. And in fact, this is very close to what, I, what, what I'm trying to say, but I want to you know, argue, argue, argue this a bit differently here. So I don't wanna, you know, I don't wanna see a space between two ends. Uh, you know, one end is intent, another is a reality and with different shades of grays in between. I don't wanna see it like that because this gap between intention and reality leaves much room for entertaining the possibility of increasing perceived human agency in terms of knowing and controlling uh, and to realize an intended outcome. So I don't wanna see intentionality and unintentionality as a mutually exclusive. And instead, I wanna see them as two aspects enfolded in one thing, constantly transitioning to each other. So our intent always leads to unintended outcomes, while the unintended outcomes are where possibility lies. So, so that's why, you know, the more I think about, you know, cultivated, cultivated wellness, uh, the more it becomes interesting to think about. Uh, the, the things that, you know, we are always producing wildness with intentional decisions. Um, now it's probably a time to, you know, conclude. Um, so cybernetic thinking has always been, has always been, uh, you know, has been around for 70, more than 70 years and has always been interpreted within a premise that things are accessible, communicative, and thus controllable. Machines are extensions of human intelligence. Through sensing, modeling, and actuating, communication can lead to controlled stability. Machines are explored with a monocultural approach, meaning you know, control and communication becomes the dominant framework to understand machines. In terms of environment, we use machines to, uh, to protect or recover a wild nature out there. And what I have shown you uh, just now with examples is, 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 is another possible way to interpret cybernetic thinking with the conviction that things are withdrawn from access, non-communicative and uncontrollable. Machines participate in the intelligence of co-production and through coding, choreographing and attuning, we reach a cultivated wellness. And it is about techno diversity as opposed to monoculture in terms of thinking about machines meaning there should be diverse way beyond communication and control to think about machines. And here I'm actually only providing one possible interpretation. I hope to inspire more uh, different ways to think about cybernetic thinking. And in the end, to think about environment is to think about wildness in machines because the unintended null space becomes a reserve for possibility and a future we cannot think of now. So, um, with these ideas, this research really launches me into thinking about a whole school of reflections about, you know, uh, based on this rather negative philosophy of non-communication and uncontrollability. So first I want to give a reflection on design. So um, there's a tendency in today's landscape discourse to understand design as a way of knowing or to prioritize knowledge as the fundament for design. So what I, mean, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, if you look at these two quotes, um, Davis, uh, Davis you know, says landscape is made of uh, instruments which are used as, way, as tools for, to, to know or to produce knowledge. And similarly, you know, um, this quote is actually from Brad and he asked me to critique him and here, here it goes. <laughs> so basically when they talking about uh, modification as a responsive strategy and Brad, Brad and Justin Holtzman argues that you know, through direct and indirect behavior adjustment, modification suggests recursive inquiry through repetitive action. So the irony is this, the post-humanist undertaking aims to cultivate a sense of humility, uh, humility in designers by reflecting on uh, their agency and control and encouraging designers to consider and embrace other frameworks that are not aligned with ours. On this level, both of these ideas, you know, uh, without doubt, provided exceptional and exceptional critiques and reflections. However, both of these responses uh, to the initial insight fall short by clinging onto the last hope for human access and human knowing. And 
This critique actually relates to my, uh, my another critique on, on a progress narratives that are so ubiquitous today. So we're so used to this idea to have a kind of idealistic thinking, envisioning ways to progress, including knowing, especially human knowing. So the things that, you know, knowledge becomes the motivation to, to produce more knowledge. And for example, you know, thinking about ecology, ecology always render an ideal condition that everything is connected uh, and, and connected to everything and things are communicating and are, are relational. And by producing knowledge about these relationships, we will be in a better place. And the ecology always assumes, you know, things wants to communicate in the first place. So is today's uh, social and racial narratives. And we always render a world where when everything happily, when everyone happily communicates with everyone. However, from a you know, triple O's perspective, as well as, you know, many cases I've shown, the, the, the sense of communication, control and stability are merely flickering moments that we find ourselves in when things accidentally align in tune and synchronize. And that uh, leads to uh, a, another reflection on a logic of coexistence based on non-communication non and uncontrollability. So uh, sociologist Nicholas Luhmann had this infamous saying, he says, you know, humans cannot communicate, not even their brains can communicate, not even their conscious mind can communicate, only communication can communicate. So from a, you know, triple O's perspective, we definitely want to push and expand this inability to communicate to all objects. And the logic of coexistence with this uh, more than human objects becomes simple. So um, we cannot communicate with each other and it is okay. Things do not have an obligation to communicate in the first place. And it is us, the stubborn human beings, who wish to form some meaningful ties with each other and with non-human beings around us because we find efficacy and a sense of agency in these ties. We see homeostasis and a sense of control in the relations we observe with other beings. Then it is our obligation to attune ourselves to them rather than communicate and control others to maintain the ties for us. So this is about adaptation, which requires great humility in my perspective. So the non-communicative nature of beings urges us to make efforts and ready to do whatever it takes to keep in sync with, 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 uh, with them. Even it means to give up what we believed in because things will quickly move out of sync due to their withdrawal nature. And this is another way to understand uh, what it means to form a kind of uh, adaptive epistemology for landscape design. So in my opinion, adaptive epistemology is not about continuous learning through recursive inquiry, but about continuous unlearning about what we used to, be, used to believe to be true. And finally, I wanna to speak to uh, design and speculative, speculative on uh, ecology, which is another concept I started to develop towards the end. So uh, if things are withdrawn and non-communicative, then any ecological thinking becomes a design, a speculation, a kind of relationship we want to see between things. And from this perspective, a built landscape, we can, we can think, think of an example, right? So a built landscape, is no longer a product of design, but a grand speculative experiment. As a design product, a uh, landscape entails designers idealistic intention about how things should be and how they should relate to each other. And if things do not turn out as expected, then the design is failed. However, suppose a de landscape design is understood as a speculation or speculative kind of experimentation uh, where we test out different arrangements of objects and observe how they interact or don't interact with each other. And in that case, there's no failure, but only unintended interactions generated from intentional design decisions. So, and the, these kind of un, un, unintended interactions may become areas of possibility. And there will be chances that, you know, things start to synchronize and to form meaningful relationships, but we should always be prepared to see things grow apart and grow out of sync because we have to respect that beings do not communicate with each other and they will always be, behave unexpectedly. So this means any meaningful relationship becomes ephemeral to some degree. 
And we always have to be resourceful to respond when we find ourselves in a new situation. 